the devil. Anyways, um, we're going to jump into the Word of God today. Ooh, I got a word for you today. If you didn't hear last week, God bless you. Go listen to it. And we're starting this week. We're in John, the fourth chapter. Jesus is going to hang out with somebody that don't look like him, don't dress like him, don't think like him, is completely different than him, and he's going to have a conversation just like we should be having every single day. So will you stand with me? Let's read the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 4. Let's pick it up in verse 7, and let's see what God has to say to us today. This one verse is so loaded that if you were a Jew, everything in this verse would shock you. Everything in it would shock you. So you should read it. Don't read it yet. I'll read it first. Uh, there came a woman of Samaria. Your response would be, <gasps> and then you should say, to draw water. Jesus said to her, <gasps> And then give me, an, all of that should surprise you. But because you're Westerners, you're just going to read it like it's just another story. All right, so read it with me, please, everybody. Here we go. Read it with me. There, a woman of, to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Next verse. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy. No, the reason they have to tell you this is because if the disciples were there, they would have said, oh, no, Jesus, we're your security guard. We're not going to let you talk to her because you're supposed to have no business, no dealings. Jews have no conversations with Samaritans. They're half-breed, something wrong with them. We don't talk to them. Actually, Jesus was supposed to go around Samaria, and he decided to go straight through it. Some of you have some friends that you should be going straight to and having conversations with, but you're going around them, and you're not talking to them, but you're talking about them as opposed to having the conversation with them. Jesus is showing us how to model what it looks like to, to walk into a messy situation. Next verse. He says, read it with me. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a... By the way, this is the longest conversation in all the Bible that Jesus has with anybody. So you should, you should perk up, take notice. This is the longest conversation that Jesus has with somebody. And he's now talking to somebody that everybody would say, you should not be talking to her. Next verse, verse 10. It says, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living. If you only knew who you were talking to, you just think you're talking to just a regular person. If you only knew who you were talking to, you wouldn't just ask me for this kind of water. You would ask me for something else so you never, ever have to come back to this well because I can give you living water. Lord, have mercy. Next verse, verse 11. You can, I can read all, all these verses in chapter 4 today, and there's a word in every verse. Here we go. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that? She asked him to meet her needs physically, and Jesus is trying to meet them spiritually. Because all of you have areas of your life you don't want the living water to go into. And Jesus is getting ready to say, no, no, no. My water goes in every nook, every cranny, every area of your life. And it will transform it if you ever allow him to put his living water Every single place that you try to keep it from. Next verse, verse 12. Here's what it says. Read it with me. You are not greater than our father Jacob. Stop right there. Jacob is a trickster. She is a trickster too. Jacob ain't nothing, ain't nothing but a liar. And she starts this whole conversation based on deception and lie. Isn't it ironic that she goes to Jacob's well to have this conversation and one trickster meets another trickster and talks to the Messiah? Lord have mercy. I'm just reading the Bible. That's all I'm doing. You should try it sometime at home. Are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Next verse. I'm going to stop here because you, some of you say, I'm standing up for a long time. Oh, my God. 
Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. If you drink of this physical water, you're going to have to come back. Next verse. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. My God, my God, my God, my God. If you can't preach that, go sell vacuum cleaners or something. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Okay, now let's talk about it a little. Let me give you a summary of where we've been. Ladies and gentlemen, we've said so far, we're doing this series, and it's called A Fearless Faith. The idea is that I'm very concerned about whether the church is prepared to deal with the messy situations that will show up. We've got a lot of people that are walking away from the faith, that are doubting God during the pandemic. Thousands and millions of people have said, I don't want to do God no more. I'm just going to do spirituality. I'm not doing Jesus. What I'm trying to do in this series is show you why. And I'm trying to prepare you with the language so you can have some conversations with people who have either walked away from the faith or people who are considering the process. So we talked last week about three words that you should get very familiar with. One is construction, the other is deconstruction, and the third is reconstruction. Say those words with me twice, please. The first one is construction. Second one is deconstruction. Third word is reconstruction. Last time, first one is construction. Second one is Third one is You got it. Here's what construction is. Construction goes like this. It is when you, you grew up in a family, you grew up in an environment where they're trying to help you um, come up with a worldview or mental models or how you should look at the world and how you should interpret things that are happening. So your parents taught you well and they, they taught you that you ought to read the Bible every day. The reason they want you to read the Bible is because they know the more you read God's word, the more you can hide God's word in your heart so that you not sin against God. They wanted you to make sure that you select your friends well. The reason they want you to do that is because they know Proverbs 13, that it says, uh, if you hang with the wise, you'll become wise, but the companions of fools suffer harm. So they know that, so they're trying to get you to do that. Then they, they wanted you to become a Christian and a Christ follower. So they know they want you to one day accept Jesus Christ. So they'll tell you the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he went to the cross and died for your sins so that you can be set free and have a connection with the Father. And they taught you all of that. But as they're teaching you that, ladies and gentlemen, then there comes some people in your life that wants to, that want, they have constructed it. Now they have some people in your life that wants to deconstruct it. So then life happens and, and, and now you start asking, why does bad, bad things happen to good people? And now you start asking the question, I don't like that. Well, these people are good people. Why did this tornado take them out? So now you start questioning your faith. Now you say, God, well, I used to be, I'm single, but I'm not working, this thing's not working out because I'm single, but I, 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 everybody I talk to, they, they don't want to marry me. So, so maybe I just need to start my own religion and my own thing because every time I try to go down this path, it ain't working for me. So maybe, God, you don't love me because you ain't providing nobody for me. So maybe I just need to walk away from the faith. Then some people start asking you questions like, well, um, if, you, if your God is that good, then why are there so many contradictions in the Bible? And you begin to say and deconstruct your faith. And all of a sudden, the stuff that you used to believe, you want not to believe now. And you start deconstructing stuff and say, maybe my faith ain't really real. Maybe it's just my mama's faith. Maybe it's just my daddy's faith. Maybe I should consider stuff for myself. Maybe I should go to my horoscope. Maybe I should go to the spirits. Maybe I should go to witchcraft. Maybe I should go to weed. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should go to white supremacy. Maybe I should go to black, supre black supremacy. 
Maybe. I just don't like how, how these people in church, they just want your money and rip your money off. Or they just want all of them to vote Democrat or all of them to vote Republican. How can a Christian vote for Trump? I can't stand Christians no more. How they going to vote? What is wrong with this? And all they're trying to do is create doubt. I have doubts. But you go to the church and you say, hey, church people, I have this doubt. And the church people say, well, if you have doubt, that means you ain't saved. So now you be like, I don't want to have nothing to do with none of y'all. All of y'all just leave me alone and let me do me. I have my own truth. I create my own religion and I'm going to do my own thing. And all of y'all can go to double H-E, double hockey sticks. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, you question in everything there is to know about God. And while we're arguing that deconstruction is not a bad thing, you should ask questions about your faith. You should question things. And you should be free enough to be a doubter in the middle of you trying to trust God. But you don't want to do that by yourself. You want to do it with a community of believers around you who can love you and walk with you through the process. Ladies and gentlemen, if your faith can't handle questions and doubters, then maybe your faith ain't real. If your faith can't handle the messy situation of life, then maybe your faith ain't real. When your kids come home and ask the question, why would you not want me to talk to this person, this gay guy that loved this other guy? Why you don't want this? such the nicest people in the world. And so, well, we just can't talk to them as a family. Well, maybe your faith needs to be reexamined. Mm -hmm. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I need you to remember something and not be so, so short-sighted. Ah, let's go back to 1970. In the 70s, ladies and gentlemen, the big deal was divorce. And anybody who talked about divorce and said they were thinking about divorce, it was like the church would shun them. Oh, you from the devil. Today, you can talk about divorce and church people encourage you to get divorced. Because it's been normalized. Because that's what the devil wants. He wants you to be, make sin a big deal and then normalize it. In the 80s, it used to be a problem when you would be shacking together. Today, if you get married early, they're looking at you like you're crazy. They're looking at you like, why, why you want to do that? I mean, you, can, you, don't have to, you don't have to get married. Just live with her. Just live with him. See if it works out. And if it don't work out, then you go y'all separate ways. You don't need to get married. It's cheaper to just kind of keep her and just see if it works. That's what it is. But in the 80s, you couldn't do that because it was a big deal. Today, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Raise your hand if you No, don't do that. Um, um. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, today it's been, say it with me, it's been normalized. But the church has to learn how to deal with this. So today, the big issue is, well, 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 you know, we don't want the LGBTQ plus community to just take over the church. And what's going on? And now it's a big deal. And so everybody's like, oh, oh, oh. Then you don't want a transgender. Oh, gosh, there used to be a, a woman. Now they're a man. And, 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 what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We got to protect the faith. We got to fight for the faith. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden... You want to highlight another big sin until the culture normalizes it and then it's not a big deal anymore. And my problem with the church is that whenever those situations show up, we want to tiptoe around them and not deal with the mess as if your Jesus wouldn't go right dab in the middle of it and show them that it does not. I can look beyond your behavior because the reason you're acting like that is because you have a hole in your heart that you're trying to fill. And the only thing that can fill that is Jesus. And I need to shine the light of Jesus in the middle of the darkness. I'm trying to help you, family. This is going to be normal too. So the church, before you become irrelevant, you better learn how to deal with messy situations. You, a believer, need to realize you are now the light that God wants to shine through you. So you don't walk around darkness, you walk into the darkness. Because your faith can deal with a messy situation. And the next generation is living it. 
They're growing up in it. And by the time you reach 2050, all of this will be normalized. And you better learn how to live by saying that Jesus Christ is still the best thing that can ever happen to you. Which is why you need to trust him as your personal Lord and Savior. And in the middle of that, he died for every single person who wants to walk away from the faith. He still died for you and he still loves you. And his arms are wide open and dying for you to run back to him. Ladies and gentlemen, if your faith can't deal with that, then you don't have a faith. Because Jesus Christ makes me better at life. I promise you that following Jesus Christ makes my life better and makes me better at life. I don't care what anybody else says. Jesus Christ, and say it one more time, makes my life better and makes me better at this thing called life. If I follow Jesus Christ, he makes my life better and makes me better at this thing that I have to live called life. And I will put that up in front of any person, no matter your lifestyle, political persuasion, where you have been hurt or pain before, that statement is still true because he's still delivering people every single day. So, I want to talk about John chapter 4. Because I think it's of paramount importance that we wrestle with all four characters in this passage. You've got the disciples. You've got the Pharisees. You've got Jesus. And you've got this woman, this Samaritan woman. All four of these people must be dealt with. And it's huge for us to consider how each of them responded in the situation that they find themselves. So, as we talk about our three words, what are they again? Construction, deconstruction. Let me show you one thing that we talked about last week, then we'll get to new content. Flip it up for me and show us what happens externally when we talk about deconstruction. What happens is you have the broken trust of spiritual leaders. Somebody hurt somebody, somebody did something that they shouldn't have done, and now people are hurt because of it, so they decide to bail the faith. You have cheap grace, people who say, yeah, grace is cheap, and you have a load of discipleship. Nobody's walking people and showing them how to bring all of life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And then you have the ascent of secular ideology, where you don't need God. You just need spirituality, where you don't need God. You just need as much money as you want, and you just need to get more money. And it's all about money and getting it, getting it, getting it, getting it. That's a wrap right there. Get it, 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 hey, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. Anyways, um, drop the beat right there. Anyways, um, um, and, so, and so if you're not careful, you have all these ideologies that show up that now wants to take you away and form a new form of spirituality. And it's happening in every high school, everyone. And it's happening on every college campus, everyone. And kids, students, Christians who grew up in a Christian faith is now considering, well, maybe what my parents taught me was not accurate. Some adults are wondering, maybe based on my experiences, Jesus ain't real. And so now what must I do? And so internally, here's what's happening in deconstruction. You have these digital inputs and this low scripture. We have low scripture intake. That is why we're going through this closer deal. We're reading the Bible and everything in our church is around this Bible because we want to increase our scripture intake. Then you have digital inputs. It is 20 to 1 for every Christian, believer, 20 to 1. You're listening to 20 secular ideologies and only one to one based on the word of God. And that number, you become what you listen to. So the more you listen to it, you become in that. And then you have a lack of fear of God. Back in the Old Testament, God would zap you and you'd die. And everybody was fearful of God. But we're in the season of grace, not law. So now nobody fears God anymore. And then you have wounded hearts. Every time somebody wants to build the faith, it's because somebody hurt them. As you listen to conversations, you should ask the question. You should just listen for the person that hurt them. You should ask questions around, but how did you get here? And ultimately, you're going to hear somebody wounded them. And because they did, they, they, they viewed that person as God or they inappropriately put them in God's spot. And so since they hurt them, they think God hurt them too. And that's how it starts. And once it gets there, now it's all a matter of how do I come up with my own religion that satisfies me. So in light of that, we go to John chapter 4. And you have the disciples, you have the, you have the Pharisees, you have Jesus, and you have the woman at the well. No, you need to listen. The, let's go with the Pharisees first. The Pharisees decided, hey, Jesus, um, you should really have nothing to do th with this woman. So what the Pharisees would have done is they would not have gone through. This was normal. They would not have gone through Samaria. They would have gone around Samaria. 
which is what we have in churches today. We have people that don't want to deal with the messy situations, so you want to walk around it. You want to leave it for somebody else. You want to say, Yo, you're, you're like the guys that saw the man hurt and walked around on the other side because they did not have the faith and the courage to say, I'm not going to leave that person for somebody else. I'm going to step into the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is calling us as believers, as the local church, to find situations like that and we step into it, not away from it. We love squeaky clean too much and it's a lie. Squeaky clean ain't true. Every single one of us got drama. All of us do. And your goal is not to compare dramas. Your goal is to look to Jesus because he's the only one that can heal you in the midst of your drama. Can I get a witness, somebody? That's what, that's what the Pharisees would do. Then let's go to the disciples. The disciples, that Jesus didn't want him initially to see him talking to this woman because she came at 12 o'clock in the middle of the day. The reason she came at 12 o'clock in the middle of the day is because she didn't want anybody to see her there. Why? Because she had a reputation. Why? Because she had five husbands and the one she was shacking with was not her husband. So she came in the middle of the day when nobody else would draw water and that's when Jesus shows up. And then the, when the disciples, by the time she has a conversation, the disciples come back, they see him now talking to her and they'll be like, whoa, you're not supposed to be talking to her. Don't you know who she is that's what church people do that's exactly what church people do church people pretend as if they're on this morally high ground but that's only because you don't do the popular sins of the culture the one that the culture shuns you don't do those but arrogance greed not tithing Hating your brother and your sister, despite them. you popularize those, but you foolishly believe that those are not as bad as somebody who has been divorced five times. So let me show you what she did. And you need to remember this. Let me show you what these disciples did. And church people, we do this all the time. We look down on her sin and ignore ours. Or let me say it another way. We minimize our sin and we maximize theirs. Somebody over here don't get it. Hold on. Y'all. Talk to each other. Let me talk over here. Somebody over here. Don't get it. We have a tendency to minimize our sin. Ours is not as bad. And maximize the sins of others. Especially those that the culture says is real bad. Or the church culture says it's real bad. So here's what it looked like back then. Back then it looked like, ooh, I mean, she'd been married five. I mean, okay, maybe one time we'd have forgiven her. But five times? Woman, what's wrong with you? Get a hold of yourself. So five times, you, and, and now you want him to forgive you again? No, girl, no, something wrong with you. You got to go get some help somewhere. Something is wrong with you. And you walk around looking down on her, not realizing that if you really understood a holy God, you would realize that one small fraction of your foolish sin is just as bad as her sin. So not only does, not only is she at the well, you need to go to the well every day too. Because your sin just as bad as hers in the sight of God. So really, everybody ought to be at the well and everybody ought to be looking for water from Jesus Christ. And the moment you begin to think that your sin ain't as bad as theirs is the moment you've committed the satanic sin of greed, of arrogance, and thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. That is why it's supposed to be normal for you to run to the well every day. Because you know you need, your, you need his mercies every day too. Just like she needs the water every day, you need it too every day. And the moment you think you are a little better, that you don't need the water that comes from that well, is the moment you have given the enemy everything he needs to mess you up. Because now you're depending on your own righteousness and not God's. And let me remind you of what the cross, here's what the cross meant. That your righteousness are like filthy rags. The best day you try to live for the glory of God is like filthy rags. And so don't you dare ever look down on somebody because of their sin. You ought to look up to Jesus because the only reason you can even talk is because his righteousness has been imputed to you because of his finished work on the cross. 
Quit your arrogance, Church of Jesus Christ, and realize that you need Jesus every day just like she does. That's the lesson for the disciples. But then there's another lesson because the woman is there too. So the woman says, hey, look at here, Jesus. Look at here, look at here, look at here. Um, I got a bucket, Jesus, and I need you to fill this bucket because Lord knows I have tried to get these men to fill this bucket. And these five men tried, and they still have not filled my bucket. So, Jesus, you better fill this bucket because I've tried man number one. He didn't work. He got it quarter away. Man number two, it didn't even, he got like a drop. Man number three, none of them could fill my bucket. And so, Jesus, you better fill my bucket. I need you to fill my bucket. That's what some of you are saying today. This is the third dude you don't be dating. And it ain't working either. Because you're looking for him to satisfy you, and he can't. The only person, you got to go to the well, not a bucket. What you want is the well, you don't want a bucket. Some of you are not getting me. All right, let's try something else. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. I got more buckets. I got more buckets. Um, so yours is not the man bucket. Maybe yours is the house bucket. And so you just believe if I get a new house, it will, it will satisfy my, if I just get out of this raggedy old apartment, it will satisfy my bucket. And all you're trying to do is say, God, will you fill me and satisfy me when I get this new house with this mani well manicured lawn, I will feel satisfied and I will feel fulfilled. And that's all you want. More money, more house, more car. If you give me that, my bucket will be satisfied and finally I will be happy. And I'm here to tell you, to tell you it's not the bucket. It's the well. It's not the bucket, somebody. It's the, what you need is the well of living water springing up inside of you. It's not the bucket. But some of you still think it's the bucket. So some of you will be like, well, pastor, I tried, I tried an African dude, an African-American dude. I'm going to try a white dude now. Uh, and so let me just try and see if a white dude can satisfy my bucket. Can I get a witness, somebody? It's the hip thing now to go interracial. Kardashians. Can you say that in church? Of course you can. Will that satisfy me? Will she satisfy me? Will he satisfy me? It's not the bucket. You can try a hundred buckets. You're still going to be unsatisfied and dissatisfied. What you need is to meet Jesus at the well who will give you the spring of living water welling up inside of you. Oh, I got more buckets. I got more buckets. I got more buckets. I got more buckets. I need, I need a red bucket this time. I need a red bucket because you want more money. And you think if you leave this job and this set of co-workers and this set of employees and this set of um, uh, people, if you just get the right group of people, you're going to be happy and you're going to be satisfied. So God, I'm going to leave this job perfect. It's COVID. Now I can't go to work. So I'm just going to start this job, get me another job. So by the time they tell me I got to come back to work, I'm going to leave them and take this job because I don't like them. Anyways, and I like this group. And if I just have the right job, I'll be satisfied. I'm just trying to help somebody. It ain't the job, baby. It ain't the job, dog. I promise you. It ain't the job. It ain't the job. What you're looking for, even if you're saved, what you're looking for is you need to run to the well. Because at the well, you have a spring of living water welling up inside so, it's not the bucket, it's the well. Say that with me. It's not the bucket, it's the well. Two more times. It's not the bucket, it's the well. Last time, it's not the bucket, it's the well. I got a big bucket. So, I wasn't going to talk about it, but let's, let's talk about this last one. One more, one more, one more, one more. This is a big, you need an oversized bucket. Because you think it's too, the bucket you got too small. So, you want more. And you want to add more to your bucket. You want your 401k to be more. And you think when I get to this magic number of financial independence. And I can tell all them employers to go somewhere. <laughs> then I'll be satisfied when I can be the captain of my own ship. And run my own life. I'm just telling you. 
as soon as you get there, you're going to realize you need something else because that won't satisfy either because you have a God-shaped heart and only God can truly satisfy it. It ain't the bucket, somebody. It ain't the bucket. 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 It's the well. That's the woman at the well. Now let's look at Jesus and see what Jesus did. So we looked at the Pharisees. We looked at the disciples. We looked at the woman at the well. Now look at, let's look at Jesus and let's watch what he did. He does five things. When he gets into a messy situation, he does five things. When you have to connect with your kids because your kids have bottomed out and said they don't want to have anything to do with your faith, now all of a sudden you have to have a conversation. What does that conversation look like? How do you, I'm going to talk to him right now about the power of connection. It's like you have a, like you have an iPod or you have um, a speaker that's connected to your phone. The way it gets connected is by peering. You have to have the Bluetooth from your phone connect with that. And when it does, it's peered and a connection takes place. When you try to connect with something that's not peered, you can talk all you want, but there is no connection happening. What I want to show you is how Jesus Christ masterfully connected and how the church, if it's going to be relevant in a, in a messed up world, has to make sure that the connection is there. I'm going to give you five things and then we're done for today. Five things that talks through how to have these connections. Go to your notes. Let me give you some, let me give you some overview, and then we go from the Jesus. He looks at four, um, he looks at four things as he walks through this. He says, I am not only the living water, he says in verses 1 through 15. Then he says, I'm a prophet. Then he says, I'm a savior. Then he says, I am the Messiah. He walks through these four, these four things and says, this is who I am as I interact with this woman. I want you to notice how he changed. He's the living water. Then he's the prophet. He's going to tell her, you got five husbands and the one you're living with is not yours now. Then he's going to be the savior of the world. Then he's going to be the Messiah because she tells her whole nation. He says, come see the one that might be the Messiah. And when they came, the whole, the whole community got saved because Jesus didn't walk around, but he walked through Samaria. Then you see, number two, you see that um, um, uh, Jesus Christ never argues with her, ever. Never, ever argues. Nor should you. He goes through the top three arguments that we face in our culture today. There are three of them, and he never argues. And he tells you and me, you don't argue with people. Argument only leads to arrogance. So watch what he says. He never argues, number one, about race. Because that's what happened in John 4 9. He never argues about race. Hey, how you, a Samaritan, talk to me, a Jew? He, he, he never argues about, well, you give me 10 reasons. Second thing, you give me 10 reasons why this is the case. Every time she tries to shift the topic to something else, he stays focused on the issue. But he never, he never goes off on the rabbit trails with her. And then lastly, religion. And he, he never argues religion with her, although she tries to go there. She's trying to talk about the fact that you have these husbands. And she says, well, hold on, your people worship here. And he said, no, 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 no. Let's come on back. Because he does not argue on any of these three and let them take him off topic. You should do the same thing. When you have time when you go home, you need to look up Titus chapter 3 verse 9, which argues the fact that you should never argue. Check it out sometime. You'll see it when you get there. I don't have time for that today. Let's go to now the power of connection. And let me show you five things Jesus does in this, in this passage of scripture that you should do too. If we're going to be a relevant church, if we're going to be a church that impacts the next generation, if your kids' faith are going to walk through the challenges of this culture, then not only must you know it and model it for them, but they must know it, and they must know how to interact with their friends when they challenge their faith as well. Jesus does five things. Take a look at them. Number one, number one, as he makes this connection, he shows up. Let's talk about the well for a moment. What happens oftentimes as Christians... We love to preach Bible when people are at the bottom of the well. We love to preach Bible. He said, yeah, what are you doing down there? You shouldn't be there. I told you you shouldn't talk to them people. I told you you shouldn't have interacted with them. And you love to preach sermons when somebody is at the bottom of the well. That is not the way you become relevant. The reason they're at the bottom of the well is because they're in pain. The reason they're at the bottom of the well is because things are not working out. They're in despair. They're in depression. They're hurting. When they're there, what you must do is join them in the well, not preach to them from the top of the well. What does Jesus do? He just shows up. He just shows up. He didn't choose the easy path. He chose the hard path, and he shows up, and he is present in and at 
the well. When you are present at the well, how do they feel, ladies and gentlemen? You know how they feel? They feel loved when you're at the well. When you just show up, what are you doing when you show up? When you show up, you're saying uh, to them, you're saying that before, you're showing up before they ask you to. You're showing up when it's inconvenient. You're showing up when they're hurting. You're showing up and you are undisrupted. You're just being present. It is the ministry of presence that people don't know how to have these days. Just show up. You're not there to fix nobody. You're there to just show up. And when you do, they feel loved. Ladies and gentlemen, when your, ki- when your kids or your grandkids decide to make a decision that's not in concert with how you would make your decision, that's not the time to preach. It's gone. That time's gone. It's no time to listen to their worldview. It's no time to understand them. It's no time to sit in the well. And you're not going to sit there for an hour. You're going to sit there for days, weeks, months. And you got to just sit there. And I know you have all the right answers. And I know the truth will set you free. But it ain't the time yet until they decide that they trust you enough to listen to what you say. Because all the other times you've been talking, they just haven't been listening. The reason we have the community, the reason why life groups is so important is because you don't wait till a problem shows up for you to then minister to them. You have to have the relationships intact so when the problem shows up, they want to talk to you. Because if not, then they know what you're going to say and you're just going to preach to them. And they don't want to hear another sermon. They want to see a life that cares. So number one, you got to show up. Number two, you got to see them. Number one, you got to show up. Number two, you got to see them. And when you see them, ladies and gentlemen, then they will feel understood. When you, when you see them, they feel, what does that mean? That they, that they feel understood. What does that mean when you see them? When you look beyond their behavior. We get stuck on their behavior too much. You got to look to the heart. When you see what they feel, don't just see what they have done. See what's the feeling and the reason they're doing what they're doing. But you got to feel that. And you got to sit there long enough to feel the pain of what they're going through without giving them your little pithy answers that they don't want to hear anyways. Because they've heard it all already. And now you've got to sit there. And when you sit there with them, they feel understood. So you got to show up. They feel loved. you got to see them. They feel understood. Number three, then you got to just listen. Listen. That, well, Pastor, they don't want to talk. Good. Here's what you do. You got to learn the art of asking great questions. Questions that will open them up. My daddy told me a long time ago. He said, son, I know how you can get anybody to talk. Let them talk about the thing they want to talk about the most. What is that, dad? Themselves. Because all of us want to talk about us. Just get someone and say, hey, man, tell me a little bit about you. Tell me what you're passionate about. The- oh, yeah, let me tell you. Well, you know, when I was two years old, ain't nobody ask you all that. But that's what they're going to do because we love talking about ourselves. And when you listen to them, they feel safe. That's what they feel. They feel safe because now it's not on your terms. It's on theirs. So now they feel like they can actually talk because you're now actually listening and you actually care because you've shown up, you've seen them, and you're just listening. Christians. My brothers and sisters, we don't do this well. We preach well. We quote verses well. We tell them the answers well. But we don't just show up. We don't just see them. We don't just listen and have nothing to say even when you know the answer. You think there's any answer Jesus didn't know? He knew it all. But yet still he asked the question. Because he wants to get them to engage their own minds and their own hearts. And it's not until number four that you now begin to do something, which is now speak life into them. What does it look like when you speak life, family? It looks like now you speak in purpose and passion. Now you're affirming them. Now you're challenging their negative thoughts. Now you're getting rid of the automatic negative thoughts that they have. But you don't do that until you have successfully done the first three. And when you listen to them, when you speak life into them, you know how they feel now? Now they feel worthy. When you speak life into them, now they feel like, one, you might be truly be listening. And now they start to feel like God intended them to feel in the first place. Which is why you speak life. This is where you need to know verses of scripture. So you cannot quote the verse in front of them unless they're ready for that. But you can speak life over them knowing the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just telling you, we don't do this, then the church is going to be obsolete. 
Because in this culture, the church is already the enemy. They think it is religion and it's churches that are the problem because you want everybody to believe like you do. And so the world has already teed them up to be defensive against the church, which is why we have to show up, which is why we have to see them, which is why we have to listen. And then you can get earn the right to speak life into them. And then lastly, you have to build grit. You have to build grit. And develop grip. And when you do that, now they feel empowered. Here's why this is so important. So now you have a lady that was ashamed of her past. The woman at the well. Jesus engages her. He shows up. He sees her. He then decides, I'm just going to listen for a moment. Then he's going to speak life into her. And then he's going to develop grit. And now she's the same one that was ashamed to go to the well when everybody was at the well. All of a sudden now goes to her whole community and say, come see, come and see a dude that told me everything there is to know about me and changed my whole life. What'd she get that from? She was coming to the well, and when she came, her head was down, and she was just trying to get a little bit of water. Now her shoulders are back, and she's going back to her community, and now they came. Jesus spends two more days, and the whole community gets saved. Why? Because somebody showed up. When everybody else would not show up, Jesus did. When everybody else would take the alternate route, Jesus showed up. Because somebody saw them, saw beyond their behavior, and just looked at the heart that was yearning for God. Yearning to be truly satisfied, not with the temporary things that are satisfying them. And then he just listened. And then he said, I'm going to speak life into you and develop good. My question for you is, are you willing to slow down enough, long enough, so that somebody can believe you when you say, I just want to hear your story. Or will they just say, you're nothing but a liar, and you just want to convert me, and that's all you want to do? Or are you just willing to sit in the mess with them? Ladies and gentlemen, there's a young man, young, man, young lady first, trans, trans, and now he's a man, did all the surgery and everything and, uh, in, in our global community. And a uh, number of churches have turned their backs on them, and now uh, came, to, came to a church and was afraid. Afraid, heard about pain-free dating, hung out at pain-free dating, and had conversations there, and we started talking about it, been hurt in a relationship, and started having conversation about it. Never wanted to ever tell the truth because, because they just thought they'd never be accepted by a church. The conversation happened over and over and again, and after a little while, um, the person told one person, and that person, oh yeah, come on, we're going to love you just the way you are. And then they said, well, oh, well I think if pastor's going to kick me out, and then set up a call, and I had a call, and I said, hey. Hey man, I'm just, my job is to love you right where you are. I'm just glad you decided to come back to church and to God. So thank you for coming back. To which some of you are saying, well, hold on, Pastor. And you're going all the way down the road to try to figure out how we're going to fix it. it. It ain't time to fix nothing yet. What it is time to them is to see them. Show up, see them, and listen. That's all your job is. And you wait, they, they have not yet brought all of life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So you don't try and tell uh, uh, somebody that's not there yet to act like they're, they're, they're 100% mature. You just love the person where they are and sit where they are and enjoy where they are and be grateful to God for where they are. But if you don't like mess and if you like squeaky clean, then you ain't going to make it in this new world that's coming. I'm just, you ain't going to make it because it ain't squeaky clean no more. Church fitting to be messy. So get used to it. And if you want a great, perfect church, when you go there, it's going to stop being that because you and your crazy life going to mess it up. So I'm just here today to say our job and our assignment is to be as authentic as we can and as real as we can. And we're not somebody's going to say, yeah, you're just lowering the standard of the God. I ain't lowering no standard of gospel. Let me explain something to you. And let me explain why. Let me explain why. I will and you should never leave the faith. If somebody has truly been saved by Jesus Christ, it means you understand the grace of God. If you truly, no, I'm not playing, no. If you truly understand the grace of God, that you were once lost, wanting to have nothing to do with him, had nothing good a part of you, there is nothing good inside of you, and you are the scum of the earth, the worst of the worst. But Jesus the Christ said, I see you, and I'm coming after you, and I want you to be a son and share in my fellowship. How dare you look at any single other person 
and said, because they did that, I'm leaving the faith. That means you don't understand grace. Grace meant you are, you, are, you are the most fortunate person on the planet that God in heaven would think to call your name. And if he called your name, you better be grateful for the rest of your life because he called your name. And since he did, don't you dare look on somebody else when he calls their name and say they're not worthy to be a part of the family of God. Don't you dare do it. That's why it gets me so excited about this series. Because for too long the church has tried to be perfect. And we're not. Only Jesus is perfect. Which is why we worship him. And not one man or one woman. And they will come and go. But Jesus Christ never will. Can I get a witness? One thing? Come on, I got to be done. I got to be done. Sit down, sit down. I got to be done. So now listen, 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 listen. So you should expect mess. So you should expect people coming to a church that's going to think differently than you and look differently than you. And that don't mean you run away from them. That means you engage them. That don't mean it's hard. And that means you need more of Jesus. And so I'm just here to tell you, when somebody has to join a group and it's not as squeaky clean as you thought, that's church. Because we're not squeaky clean either. Family, get used to it. Now, am I saying lower the standard? No. I'm saying maintain your standard but realize people's levels of commitment. And your job is not to ask a baby Christian to live at this standard today. Your job is to ask a baby Christian to slowly bring all of life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm done with y'all. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. All right. All uh, right. I have an assignment for you, and then we're going to welcome some guests and then some members, and then we're done. I don't want you to move right now, by the way. Uh, this, is, this is equally as important as the message. Here's your assignment this week. I want you to pray and ask God to give you somebody that's uncomfortable to hang out with. <laughs> bless him, God. Bless him. Not with a house, not with a car, but with some drama for them to hang out with. Praise the Lord. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Receive that blessing. Receive that. Receive. It's a blessing. Get, grab, your, grab your blessing. Grab your blessing. You don't want to grab that one, huh? It's just when a new job comes, you want to grab it. When a new clothes come and cars, you want to grab it. I'm giving you a blessing to grab. Because who to tell that when you, when you represent Christ to that one life, a whole generation won't be saved. That's a real blessing right there. Anyway, so here's my prayer for you, that every person under the sound of my voice will encounter somebody over the next two weeks that don't think like you, act like you, love like you, believe like you, like the same things you like, and that your job it will be to do those five things. Show up. See them. Listen to them. Come on, say them with me. Show up. See them. Listen to them. Speak life to them. And then develop Greek. That's your job. So everybody, I don't care if you're in here today and you're 10 years old, or if you're in here today and you're 95 years old, where, wherever you are on the spectrum, I'm asking God to disrupt your life and give you a John 4 moment when you're going to need him more than you ever have before to love somebody that's hard for you to love in the midst of it. So take 15 seconds and pray that God will send you that person. You in church, don't lie. It's 15 seconds right now, quickly, and pray that God will bless you and provide that person for you to demonstrate the goodness, the grace, the mercy, the love, the favor of God on their lives. This is your assignment. This is how you apply the word this week. Five more seconds. Come on, family. Come on, ask him, ask him, ask him. Heavenly Father, thank you for a body of believers that's even open to this. For far too long, the church has not been. Uh, will you help us to, to take our faith to the marketplace?
and to find individuals that have long been shunned by the church. And let us be the ones that shine the light in the middle of the dark. God, we know that all are hurting and what they need is a savior. What they need is a personal relationship to, with Jesus so they can drink from the well that springs up within them as living water so that they never thirst again. They can't see it right now, but we know the answer. But help us to simply show up, to see them the way you see them, to listen with the intent to understand, to speak life. And then to develop grip. Will you raise up a generation, a new generation of believers that's willing to run toward it, not around it, for the glory of God? We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody say. Come on, give God a round of applause. Come on.